Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Mackey and you're watching Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic's Facebook Live. Today we're discussing thyroid problems in children and teens. Thyroid problems are common among adults but can have similar concerns at younger ages. Joining us today for the discussion of thyroid dysfunction and the evaluation of nodules and thyroid cancer are two experts in this area. The first is Dr. Siobhan Pidock, who is a pediatric endocrinologist at the Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota. She's a special interest in the thyroid gland and pediatric thyroid cancer. Dr. Pidock is also an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Mayo Clinic. Our second expert is Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, who is an endocrine surgeon and the section head of endocrine surgery at Mayo Clinic. He is the past president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons and former senior associate dean for faculty affairs at Mayo Clinic School of Medicine. Dr. Thompson is a professor of surgery at Mayo Clinic. We want to help answer any questions you guys have about pediatric thyroid dysfunction, nodules, and thyroid cancer. So please post your questions below on the Facebook Live comment section, and we'll try to get them today during our live broadcast. So Dr. Pidock, Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for joining me here today. Happy thank to you be for here. having us. We're going to start with having Dr. Pidock kind of help talk a little bit more about thyroid dysfunction. But Dr. Thompson, please feel free to um, add in anything that, that as the discussion goes along. Okay. So let's start off by first... Where is the thyroid located so people can understand that? And what are some of the roles that it maintains in our body's metabolism? So the thyroid gland sits in the front of the neck here. Mm -hmm. um, people call it the a butterfly gland because it's kind of narrow in the middle mm -hmm. and then it has like two wings on the side. Mm -hmm. So you'll often see butterfly and thyroid mentioned together. And really the best way to think of its function is that it makes thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone is kind of the body's speed regulator. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way to think of it is that thyroid, the thyroid gland, when it's working well, keeps your body moving at the right speed. Not too fast, not too slow. Okay, so what can go wrong with the thyroid then if, uh, it, if it's not regulating the, mm -hmm. the, the speed at which your body should process its, its me metabolism? So the thyroid gland, there can be lots of problems with mm -hmm. the thyroid gland. Children can be born with no thyroid gland, so mm -hmm. they don't make any thyroid hormone then the thyroid gland can look normal but not work normally. So mm -hmm. sometimes the thyroid gland makes too much hormone and that's called hyperthyroidism. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it makes too little hormone and that's called hypothyroidism. And sometimes it makes the right amount of hormone but there's a lump or a bump mm -hmm. or a bubble within the right. thyroid gland. Right, so when, when it, the thyroid isn't making enough hormone, uh, what is that called and what are some of those symptoms that parents should watch for? So hypothyroidism is what we call it when the thyroid is underactive. And hypothyroidism is the most common problem we see with in the thyroid gland, both for adults and children. Super common in adults and also common in children. Um, in adults, um, an underactive thyroid gland mm -hmm. causes uh, the metabolism to be slower. Mm -hmm. People tend to feel tired. Their heart rate may be slower. They tend to feel cold, have drier hair, dry skin. They're all pretty vague symptoms mm -hmm. that a lot of people may have. And obviously, most people who have those symptoms don't have a thyroid problem. Right. In children, those same symptoms occur. Uh, constipation can be really common. But in children, beyond what happens in adults, there are two really important additional um, symptoms that occur mm -hmm. and that's in children thyroid hormone is really critical for growth so children who don't have a working thyroid gland who have an underactive thyroid gland don't grow well so that's often the first thing mm -hmm. that is noticed in children who kind of seem otherwise well and in babies under the age of three the thyroid gland is really important for normal brain development absolutely and you said the, the one that we we see often at birth is called congenital mm -hmm. hypothyroidism and is that universally screened for around the United States? Yeah, that's okay. an excellent question. The, because the thyroid hormone mm -hmm. is so important for brain development, it is one of the tests that is tested. Remember that heel prick mm -hmm. that every baby gets? That blood spot is tested for hypothyroidism so that any baby with hypothyroidism can be started on thyroid medicine straight away mm -hmm. and then end up having a normal, completely normal development. Okay. Um, that's the good news yeah, about right. under an underactive yeah. thyroid. We have a really good medicine to treat it. Absolutely. And you you just take the medicine every day mm -hmm. and it replaces what the thyroid would normally produce, yeah. right? It's an okay. exact replica of the thyroid hormone the medicine the yeah. body makes. So exact that when we do a blood test, yeah. you can't actually tell the difference if this is a medicine somebody right. took or if it's the thyroid hormone medicine, um, thyroid hormone that their own gland produced. Um, so because of that, it also doesn't have a lot of interactions and side effects with other medications. So we have excellent treatment for hypothyroidism. Okay, so what if the thyroid is 
working too well and producing too much hormone what's that called and what is that going to look like in children yeah so that's called hyperthyroidism it's much less common than hypothyroidism and so remember getting back to the function of the hormone and working at the right speed everything kind of gets sped up so if you think about hypo everything is slowed mm -hmm. down hyper everything is sped up mm -hmm. so the heart rate is fast so children will have palpitations or a racing heart Sometimes little ones don't exactly say, I have a racing heart, mm -hmm. but they may kind of hold their chest because it feels different or mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Um, children tend to sweat a lot. They feel much warmer than they should. Mm -hmm. So everyone else in the house is layering up with clothes and they're stripping off. Right. Um, it kind of, the, again, it's sort of everything the opposite to hypo. Children yeah. with hyperthyroidism actually tend to grow fast. So it's not a good way to be because it, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, end, it doesn't help you be taller in the end mm -hmm. and it has other side effects. But children may, you may notice that they would grow really quickly, they'd have diarrhea. Oftentimes they've great difficulty concentrating at school because even their mind is sped up mm -hmm. and they find it difficult to focus on things. Okay. Um, so those, are, those would be the main things that, uh, that parents kind of notice in their children. Which one of these is more common, the hypo or the hyperthyroidism? Hypo is far more common okay. than hyper. Okay. So in hyperthyroidism, it, we have, do we have a nice pill that we can mm -hmm. give people like we do with the hypothyroidism, or is it going to be a different treatment? So the treatment kind of depends on the cause. Okay. Um, sometimes the cause of hyperthyroidism is, believe it or not, that the child got into grandma's medication. <laughs> and obviously the treatment for right. that is lock medicines, keep them up high and keep them away from your child. A good recommendation always. Always. Yes. <laughs> um, sometimes it's due to just some inflammation or like an infection in the thyroid gland and that generally goes away all by itself and so we don't need to we kind of have to wait and okay. we give some medicine to uh, to help the body feel a bit better but we don't have to give anything to do with the thyroid gland and let it settle out sometimes it's due to a condition called Graves disease and Graves disease is I have to interject because it's, it's an awful name for disease because it, it sounds like a cemetery and it yes. has nothing to do with that. <laughs> it, is, it was named New after the person okay. who discovered the disease, who I'm was sorry. Dr. Grave. Yes. So he called it after himself, but it's a kind of an unfortunate name. Mm -hmm. So Graves' disease is, uh, is caused, is, happens when the thyroid gland is actually working too mm -hmm. hard. And in that situation, we do have to slow it down somehow. Okay. And we have three ways to slow it down. We can give medicine. Um, and the medicine just slows down the thyroid gland and mm -hmm. we usually give it for a few years and some people then will outgrow the problem and that's all they need and then they go on and they have a thyroid gland that works normally for the rest of their lives. Okay. Sometimes after coming off the medicine mm -hmm. it comes back again okay. and then we have to sort of decide mm -hmm. again if mm -hmm. we're going to do something. So that's one option, medicine. Okay. Another option is that we can give um, medicine called radioactive iodine that just kills the gland. So it's a, it's a specialized medicine. Mm -hmm. Iodine is pretty cool. It's really only needed in the body in the thyroid mm -hmm. gland. So whenever we take iodine in our diet or as a medicine, it goes to our thyroid gland, but the nuclear doctors actually attach a little piece of radiation to the iodine. And then when you swallow the iodine, it goes to the thyroid gland, but guess what? The thyroid gland doesn't know it's taking in something that's gonna kill it. Right. So that is a very effective treatment for um, hyperthyroidism. The problem is we have to kill the gland to do the treatment. Mm -hmm. And when we kill the gland, then we're left with Hypo hypothyroidism, right, yeah. which we know we have a great treatment for, and okay. those children then need to take thyroid hormone medicine for the rest of their lives. The third option is surgery. Um, and so sometimes we, we go ahead and do surgery for uh, Graves' disease. Okay. And I'm going to let Dr. Thompson, yeah. since he's the one who does that, to yeah. uh, discuss that. When, when we think about hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease in, in adults, probably 98% or close to it get treated with radioactive iodine. Okay. But in children, there's much more concern about the potential risks associated with radioactive iodine. We don't have as many studies out there where we know that it's absolutely as safe. Mm -hmm. We are using it for some of our older teenagers, mm -hmm. uh, but particularly for the real young kids, the pre-adolescent kids that we uh, typically favor going ahead with surgery. There are, there are some other situations where surgery is probably better mm -hmm. to treat Graves' disease if there's a suspicious nodule that mm -hmm. might potentially be a cancer. Uh, if the patients, patients with Graves' disease can get eye findings mm -hmm. and uh, if they have significant eye disease, so we call Graves' ophthalmopathy, 
um, they do better with surgery than with radioactive iodine. Their eye disease can actually get worse w with the radioactive iodine. So uh, we work together with our pediatric yeah. endocrinologist to come up with the, what we think is the best solution. Okay, and if you decide that surgery is the best solution, what is that procedure going to entail? Is it, are you taking out the entire thyroid gland? Are you sparing part of it? What does it look like? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think we have a, a picture of a yeah. thyroid. So there you can see uh, the neck, and you see the butterfly-shaped thyroid gland uh, in the middle sitting in front of the windpipe. And that line going across the bottom there is actually the uh, incision that we use to gain access to both sides of the thyroid gland. And that's, of course, one difference between radioactive iodine and surgical treatment is that there's going to be a scar. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we do everything possible to make it a cosmetically appealing scar and, and give the patient and their, and their parents various treatments uh, that, that they can use for the first year after the surgery to try to make it look as good as possible. But um, we go in and we remove, typically we remove either all or about 98% of the thyroid. Sometimes we leave a little bit of thyroid tissue to try to protect the parathyroid glands which sit alongside the thyroid and regulate calcium and phosphorus balance in the body. And so we don't want to lose that function because mm -hmm. that's one potential complication with the surgery. And um, so we, we sometimes, as I said, leave a little mm -hmm. bit of thyroid tissue behind. But we want to get out as much as possible mm -hmm. so that we basically accomplish the same thing that the radioiodine does. And the nice thing about this is it happens much quicker. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty much instantaneous. Right, and the child's probably going to go back to feeling feeling much better, better especially soon. once yeah. they get that yeah. thyroid yeah. Uh, replacement hormone started, yeah. right? Because that's yeah. something they're going to be going to going back on right after yes. the surgery. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, what are um, some other concerns with the surgery? I know there's sure. some other important really important structures right, right in that area. Right. So the other area of concern are the what we call the recurrent laryngeal nerves. Mm -hmm. And these nerves course underneath the thyroid gland and go up to the voice box, the larynx, and they control the muscular contraction of, of the vocal cords. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously this is some, something that we want to protect. Uh, but particularly in, in Graves' disease where things are somewhat inflamed and oftentimes there's enlarged lymph glands around, uh, it can be challenging to separate the nerve away from the thyroid gland. Uh, so there are situations where a patient may wake up hoarse after the surgery. As long as the nerve remains intact, uh, we can pretty much guarantee that the voice is going to recover in time. It may take several weeks for that to happen or okay. just a few weeks. Um, so that that's you know that's the main concern. If the mm -hmm. if the nerve is sacrificed, if it's it's permanently damaged at the mm -hmm. time of surgery, then the patient can have significant hoarseness afterwards. Our experience here, where we do a lot of this type of surgery, is that uh, probably less than one percent have permanent hoarseness in their voice, and it doesn't have to stay permanent because mm -hmm. if it is an ongoing problem uh, for the patient, they can uh, be seen by our ENT colleagues, mm -hmm. and there are procedures that can be done to uh, strengthen the voice even in the setting. Of of a paralyzed vocal cord. Okay, thanks for helping explain that. Yep. Um, I have a question probably mostly for Dr. Pittock. It's an audience question coming in. And they're saying, you know, a lot of parents, as we said, thyroid problem is common in adults. So a lot of parents may have thyroid problems. What is the likelihood that that's also gonna be a problem with their children? Mm -hmm. um, it's something that this, this parent had a question is, can they pass it down? Um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, it's not passed down like brown eyes, blue eyes, right. curly hair, straight hair. Yep. So it's not a direct genetically inherited. Mm -hmm. But the majority of um, thyroid disease in adults is caused by autoimmune. Mm -hmm. it's, it's called Hashimoto's. So yep. oftentimes people, you'll hear them saying, some people say I have hypothyroidism or I have Hashimoto's and probably it's the same thing they're mm -hmm. talking about. And people who have autoimmune conditions tend to have families who also can have autoimmune conditions. So mm -hmm. yes, it's possible, but it's not so common that we go ahead and test for it. So if I were to have thyroid mm -hmm. disease, my mm -hmm. children don't need testing, but if my child weren't growing too well, mm -hmm. then my doctor might say, hmm, and you have thyroid disease, let's just check out Johnny to make sure that his thyroid is working well, since we know that in your family that's something mm -hmm. that could happen. Absolutely. So those symptoms you talked about, yeah. for especially for the hypothyroidism, because it's so much more common, Yes. Um, that would be what you'd be looking for, yeah. and not necessarily just prophylactically checking exactly. for everything. Okay. Exactly. Sounds good. So another thing that can go wrong with the thyroid is nodules, right? Mm -hmm. You talked about the lumps and bumps and bubbles mm -hmm. that can happen in it. So can you tell us what a little bit more about thyroid nodules? And I yeah. think we have a nice diagram to help mm -hmm. us describe that. 
So a nodule is just a lump, um, mm -hmm. and that's really the easiest way to think about it. So some thyroid nodules, um, sometimes people will have a, just a single nodule in their thyroid gland, and sometimes they'll have two, and sometimes their gland will be full of nodules. Mm -hmm. So you'll see the picture here with the multi-nodular goiter. That's actually much more common, much more commonly seen in adults than in children, but some children get it. Um, typically, nodules are made up of they kind of look pretty similar to the uh, the surrounding tissue. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so how would that present? How how would a parent know to be looking for a, a thyroid nodule, a bump on their on their child's neck? If they notice a bump, yeah, right. So the most important thing is. First of all, lumps and bumps in the neck in children, especially small children, are incredibly common. Right. If if you go home this evening and mm -hmm. feel your children's necks, you'll find little lumps and bumps kind of all along the neck. Bumps in the front are less common. So if you notice a lump, you don't have to go checking all of the time, but if mm -hmm. you notice a lump, it's something that your uh, primary care provider should right. look at and should feel. Um, your primary care provider should be feeling the neck once a year when your child is having their annual physicals. Mm -hmm. And if you notice a lump even further back in the neck and it just doesn't seem to be going mm -hmm. away, then that's something that should be checked out. Absolutely. And you're, you reg you're referring to all those lymph nodes that sometimes yeah. can be in the, yeah. in the back part as well. So why do we want to be why do we, or not, shouldn't phrase it that way, why are we concerned about that right now, Jules? Um, what can they represent? Yeah, so the reason we're concerned is that the vast majority are harmless. Even if we discover that mm -hmm. this lump in Johnny's neck mm -hmm. is not a lymph node, it's actually within the thyroid, mm -hmm. the majority of nodules are still harmless. Even in children? Uh, even in children. Okay. Um, but they're not as common, they're, nodules are really common in adults, so over half of the elderly will have nodules, especially if you test for them. Mm -hmm. If you actually take out a scanner and look mm -hmm. for nodules, you'll find nodules. <laughs> um, so they're super common in adults and sometimes they're caused by cancer. Okay. In children, it's hard to know exactly how often they happen, but mm -hmm. if you go around and with an ultrasound machine and ultrasound every child, mm -hmm. which obviously we don't do, but in research studies, mm -hmm. they probably occur in about 2% of children. About 1 in 50 children has a nodule. So they're not at all as common as mm -hmm. they are in grown-ups. Mm -hmm. When we do find them in children, because your doctor notices a lump in your neck or mm -hmm. you notice a lump in the neck, it's more common that they are caused by cancer. It's still probably about one in five, mm -hmm. so not at all the majority, mm -hmm. but a sizable minority. And so we want to figure out which nodule is a harmless one and which nodule is caused by cancer because thyroid cancer is incredibly treatable. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to treat it as early as we can treat it so that we can have our children live long, healthy, happy lives. Absolutely. What, there's, there's many different types of thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. What are the types that are gonna be seen more common in, commonly in children? So the, by far the, the most common thyroid mm -hmm. cancer in children is a thyroid cancer called papillary thyroid cancer. And lucky for us in pediatrics mm -hmm. that none of us obviously choose that anyone gets cancer, but if you were to get thyroid mm -hmm. cancer, that is by far the best one to get in terms of it has the best outcomes for treatment. Okay. There are other cancers um, called, there's another one called medullary thyroid cancer, and that's a very specific type of thyroid cancer mm -hmm. that is very often genetically inherited. So um, in adults, if they're found to have medullary thyroid cancer, they have a lot of genetic tests done to see if they have a genetic form, mm -hmm. and that's a situation where their children would be tested for the gene abnormality, and so we often know that a child may be at risk for getting that type of cancer, and then Dr. Thompson is actually taking out thyroid glands before those children get cancer, if they have this okay. very rare mm -hmm. um, uh, cancer syndrome. Got it. So if a doctor has discovered the thyroid nodule, say it's myself, I'm in a primary care visit, mm -hmm. I find a nodule, I'm probably going to call you up and say, Dr. Pittock, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. But can you help explain the process for us, for what a family should expect if, if they've been recently mm -hmm. diagnosed with a thyroid nodule? So if there is a nodule, by far the best test is a pretty simple one, it's an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. So ultrasound seems kind of low tech mm -hmm. with all of the fancy scanners that hospitals have now, right. but ultrasound is actually the best way to look at mm -hmm. uh, to look at a thyroid gland. Even though we have access here to mm -hmm. all the fancy scanners, I'd still choose ultrasound. So an ultrasound is by far the most uh, common next step test. 
Um, there's no perfect, the ultrasound isn't still a perfect test, mm -hmm. but we get a very good sense from mm -hmm. the ultrasound, especially if it's done um, in places where they're used to looking mm -hmm. at number one thyroid glands and number two children's thyroid mm -hmm. glands. So people where people who have experience in looking at nodules mm -hmm. very commonly, um, because then the radiologist can give us a very good idea. This one looks totally harmless. Mm -hmm. This one looks for sure like a cancer, mm -hmm. or this one, oh, I'm not sure about. So that gets into the benefits of really being seen at a multi-specialty mm -hmm. uh, center that has a lot of experience. And I think that's something that you guys have unique here and that you're able to bring in the adult experience and mm -hmm. pediatric experience together and really deliver excellent care. Yeah. So we have a thyroid, thyroid nodules, like I said, mm -hmm. aren't that common mm -hmm. in children. Um, and so what we try and do here is is use the expertise our pediatric radiologists mm -hmm. because we're a center for thyroid mm -hmm. cancer are very commonly looking at thyroid ultrasounds both benign nodules mm -hmm. and um, and uh, malignant ones or thyroid cancer ones we have I, we actually have our thyroid surgeons mm -hmm. so dr thompson is an endocrine surgeon not a specific pediatric surgeon mm -hmm. and that's because endocrine surgeons do lots and lots of thyroid surgeries mm -hmm. and the studies really support that mm -hmm. if you're going to have your thyroid out no matter your age you should have it taken out by someone who has taken out a lot of thyroid glands because then the then the yeah. complication rates are much lower. Absolutely. Yeah. So if this ultrasound procedure um, shows that this looks like a thyroid nodule that resembles one that may be cancerous, um, are you bringing in Dr. Thompson um, pretty early in the process to decide for treatments? So the next step, if the ultrasound looks suspicious, actually the next mm -hmm. step is to do what we call a biopsy or a, a it's called a fine needle aspiration biopsy. Mm -hmm. That's just a fancy way of saying we put a needle into the nodule in the gland, mm -hmm. we pull out some cells and look at it under the microscope. So that's the that's better than an ultrasound mm -hmm. at uh, determining whether something looks like cancer or not. Um, what we really try and do, if I have somebody referred to me, we have a, a thyroid nodule clinic, so what I really try and do is see my patients first thing in the morning, mm -hmm. let them know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. send them to ultrasound, the radiologist calls me, they say, yes, it looks totally harmless, I say stop, do mm -hmm. nothing, or they say, yes, it looks like cancer, mm -hmm. then they proceed and they do the biopsy there and then, mm -hmm. and then in the afternoon, I see them back, the pathologist has already looked at the slides and if it looks like it's wow. one that needs surgery Dr. Thompson and I meet the patients in the afternoon. Wow. So it doesn't one, always yeah, work like right. that but our depending on we people's try. schedules we really try and wow. you know it's pretty anxiety provoking. Absolutely. We're yeah. here sitting here saying thyroid cancer is totally treatable and mm -hmm. it's but it's still got that word cancer mm -hmm. and when it, if it's your child mm -hmm. you don't want anything wrong and we really try and get people answers as soon as we possibly can. Okay, so is the surgery um, for thyroid um, cancer going to be similar to when you're taking out for hyperthyroidism, or is it a different process that you're no? Going it, it, it's somewhat similar, and typically, if we're dealing with a cancer that's say over a centimeter in size or a centimeter and a half, we typically remove all of the thyroid gland, or mm -hmm. we may leave a little bit of tissue on the no more normal side, mm -hmm. again, to protect the parathyroid. So the last thing we mm -hmm. want is to uh, make the child hypoparathyroid, and they have to be treated with excess calcium and vitamin D supplements uh, indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So we don't, wanna, we don't wanna do that. The other thing that's different is that we take a close look at the lymph nodes. And one thing we do preoperatively is we ask our pediatric radiologist to map out the various lymph node sites throughout the neck and tell us whether or not there are any suspicious looking lymph nodes. And depending on how they look, we may ask them to biopsy them to, mm -hmm. to prove it. Because at the same time as the thyroidectomy, we would do a lymph node operation where we clean out the lymph mm -hmm. nodes in that particular region. The most common area is right around the thyroid gland itself. And those are difficult to pick up when the thyroid is still in place, mm -hmm. but we will, uh, at the time of surgery, clean those lymph nodes out as well. Small, very small papillary thyroid cancers, more and more now we're thinking of just taking out half the thyroid gland if the other half looks okay. Okay. If you're keeping half of that thyroid in, is that going to be enough to produce normal thyroid hormone and maintain the function? Often yeah. it is. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Kind of like yeah. other parts yeah. in your body. Yeah. if. 
if you know for some reason you happen to lose a kidney right. we can often get by with one kidney also you can often get by with just a half a thyroid gland and that's the benefit of yeah. mm. you know doing less aggressive surgery if you don't have to and really um, studies uh, uh, we sort of follow things in adults and on the adult side they're doing mm. that more and now mm. on the pediatric side we're also doing it too Fantastic. When you mentioned you're mapping out the lymph nodes, can you explain to parents what that means? Is that going to be done with an ultrasound, or is that going to be done with some type of imaging, other so, imaging? Yeah, it's. It, it, I mean, it could be done with other forms of in, okay. imaging, but the primary uh, modality is is ultrasound. And basically, the radiologist looks all along the the vessels in the neck, and uh, we have anatomic definitions of what's level one, what's level two, what's level three, and they'll actually draw it on a little cartoon for us where, where these lymph nodes are. And that will determine the extent uh, of the lymphadenectomy or the lymph node operation that we have to do. Okay. Um, how is the recovery process for the kids after they've undergone this procedure? How long should they expect to be in the hospital? Yeah, kids, kids do really well. <laughs> they bounce back so quickly. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's really a satisfying, very satisfying part of my practice because they do bounce back so quickly. Typically, they're in the hospital overnight and they go home the next day more often than not. And I would say usually within seven to ten days, uh, they're you know back to normal, doing everything that they were doing before. Sometimes the real little kids are fine the next day. So. Yeah. It's amazing how how well young children recover right. with everything. Yeah. Um, what 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 is the follow up going to look like? How are yeah. you going to make sure that the, the cancer isn't coming back, yeah. or you got it all? What what kind of um, follow up are you guys recommending for families? So the kind of intensity of the follow up mm -hmm. depends on how extensive the thyroid okay. cancer is. Right. But the basics of the follow up. Remember, we've now taken out the thyroid gland. So. Just like a child born without mm -hmm. one or somebody with Graves' disease where we took it out, now mm -hmm. your body doesn't make any thyroid hormone. Right. So you're going to take thyroid hormone medicine every day for the rest of your life. Um, what we try to do is stop the body kind of trying to stimulate whatever cells are left. And so we want to make certain sure. It's obviously always important to take medicines that are prescribed. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, thyroid hormone is also acting as an anti-cancer medicine mm -hmm. because when the body is comfortable with the amount of thyroid hormone, well, then the body isn't trying to stimulate mm -hmm. what's left to make more. And the, the same hormone that stimulates the thyroid gland that thinks it's stimulating the thyroid gland to make hormone, mm -hmm. if you have not enough around, mm -hmm. um, is also stimulating um, good cells and bad cells, and so we want to keep that quiet. So there are blood tests. Um, some patients will actually give radioactive iodine. We talked about mm -hmm. radioactive iodine for mm -hmm. graves, remember? Right. Iodine only goes to the thyroid, and we put a little mm -hmm sting in the tail if you like from <laughs> nuclear right. medicine and then it, it damages and right. that will go to anywhere in the body that there are that there are any thyroid okay. cells left so some mm -hmm. patients not every patient and mm -hmm. in fact our practice has been um, more conservative than many for a long time not giving radioactive iodine to everyone and the mm -hmm. most recent guidelines um, from the American Thyroid Association really support what we've been doing. So we don't give everybody radioactive iodine, but you may have radioactive iodine. Mm -hmm. And then the follow-up is really with the ultrasounds and blood tests. So that would usually be with me, and when if we see mm -hmm. additional little mm -hmm. um, areas coming up, I get Dr. Thompson back involved. The thing about thyroid cancer in children is that it's incredibly treatable, um, but children, when they're diagnosed, it's often much um, they have often have much more cancer than adults do. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be slightly, it behaves a little mm -hmm. bit differently than in adults. The good thing is that it responds beautifully to treatment, but long-term follow-up is really critical because even somebody who is going to live until they're 100 and die of you know, heart disease or whatever other thing mm -hmm. that hundred year olds die of, they may have a few little bouts of a recurrence of their thyroid cancer that we may need to you know, intervene again, sometimes intervening surgically again, mm -hmm. or sometimes with uh, other treatments. Okay. So um, it's really ultrasound follow-up, blood test follow-up, typically with me on the medical side, mm -hmm. with Dr. Thompson kind of mm -hmm. stepping in, in and out, if we need him along the way. Okay. 
Is there any other screening that you would need to do in these these patients later on in life besides looking for their thyroid? Are there any other cancers, per se, that they would be at risk for? No, that's an excellent okay. question. The vast, vast majority of thyroid cancers mm-hmm. in children are these papillary thyroid Absolutely. cancers, and papillary thyroid cancers are not associated with other worrisome cancers. Absolutely. Now, the rare one, remember mm-hmm. the medullary? The medullary. Mm-hmm. That's a different story, right. and, and those children we're watching very closely for other reasons, yes. and those children, like I said, oftentimes are diagnosed because a mother or a father or an older mm-hmm. sibling has been diagnosed with thyroid cancer and so with early genetic testing they're actually having their thyroids taken out before they even have cancer which wow. is our goal wow that's fantastic i um really enjoyed this discussion i have another uh, couple questions from the audience um, that don't necessarily fit with the thyroid cancer most of them are for dr piddock um, Families are wondering what's a normal range for the TSH in in children, and I'm guessing that's going to depend on what lab you're at, right? So we, there isn't really a, a range yeah. that we can necessarily give. There isn't really a range. Mm-hmm. It's higher in babies, mm-hmm. um, and then by about a year, it settles. It settles out. Mm-hmm. Different labs have done different work with testing for specific ages, and so they may have more ballpark TSH, but. Every lab is different, but Mm -hmm. ballpark up to about five Mm -hmm. is normal from about 0.5 to five. I always say over 10, yeah, there's a problem. (laughs) And between five and 10, and again, ballpark five and 10, depending on what lab you're in. Well then, that's a sort of a gray zone one. And that's an area Mm -hmm. that we'll sometimes say, hmm, what else is going on? Um, We often see that kind of range in children who are obese. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they have thyroid disease, it's because of obesity. And so uh, a gray zone one, I might say, let's check that again in six months and see. Uh, rather than necessarily saying, oh, for sure you have a thyroid problem. Absolutely. And that gets at our second audience question. They were they were asking, can there be other things that can cause the TSH to be mildly low or mildly high? Um, and so you just alluded to some of them. Um, yeah. So especially if it's in that borderline range, is yeah. that right? Okay. So especially in the borderline, uh, the most common one that we see is actually obesity. So children with obesity, mm-hmm. far more of them have these borderline TSHs. Unfortunately, people sometimes hope, oh, is that because my thyroid is causing the obesity? Mm-hmm. But studies really support that when children, when those children are not put in any treatment, but they lose weight, that the TSH comes down. So it seems to be that the obesity causes the high TSH. Another really common one is that multivitamins. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of multivitamins contain biotin. And in a lot of the blood tests, the particular machines that are used, Mm -hmm. biotin can interfere. Um, So it's always, if you have a borderline Mm -hmm. TSH, what I'm always going to ask is, were you on a multivitamin? Let's see what's in it. And biotin is in most of them. So that's easily managed by just coming off the multivitamin Mm -hmm. for a couple of days before you do the blood test. So mild variations, people don't need to get too excited. We just need some follow-up and kind of see in what direction it's going. Exactly. Okay, sounds good. Well, this was a wonderful discussion. Thank you both for joining us today. I think I learned a lot as well. You're welcome. Um, Please join us for the next Ask the Mayo Mom, which will be on December 7th. The topic will be vascular malformations in children, and our guest will be the director of the Vascular Malformations Clinic, who, who is Dr. Mega Thompson. So vascular malformations could include things such as Sturridge-Weber syndrome, kippel chernowney syndrome, lymphatic and venous malformations, as well as vascular tumors in infancy. So it's going to be a great discussion. Please join the conversation and send in your questions. Thank you everyone who joined us and have a wonderful day.